Chapter 1 of Stand By for Mars. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sean O'Hara. Stand By for Mars by Kerry Rockwell. Chapter 1. Stand to you, rocket wash! A harsh, bull throated roar thundered over the platform of the monorail station at Space Academy and suddenly the lively chatter and laughter of more than a hundred boys was stilled. Tumbling out of the gleaming monorail cars, they froze to quick attention, their eyes turned to the main exit ramp. They saw a short, squat, heavily built man, wearing the scarlet uniform of the enlisted Solar Guard, staring down at them. His fists jammed into his hips and his feet spread wide apart. He stood there a moment, the sharp eyes flickering over the silent clusters, then slowly sauntered down the ramp towards them with a strangely light, cat-footed tread. Warm up! Columns of four, almost before the echoes of his thunderous voice died down, the scattered groups of boys had formed themselves into four ragged lines along the platform. The scarlet-clad figure stood before them, his seamed and weather-beaten face set in stern lines. But there was a glint of laughter in his eyes as he noticed the grotesque and sometimes torturous positions of some of the boys as they braced themselves in what they considered a military pose. Every year for the last ten years, he had met the trains at the monorail station. Every year, he had seen boys in their late teens, gathered from Earth, Mars, and Venus, three planets millions of miles apart. They were dressed in many different styles of clothes, the loose flowing robes of the lads from the Martian deserts, the knee-length shorts and high stockings of the boys from the Venusian jungles, the very colored jacket and trouser combinations of the boys from the magnificent Earth cities. But they all had one thing in common, a dream. They had visions of becoming space cadets, and later, officers of the Solar Guard. Each dreamed of the day when he would command rocket ships that patrolled the space lanes, from the outer edges of Pluto to the twilight zone of Mercury. They were all the same. All right now, let's get squared away. His voice was a little more friendly now. My name's McKenney, Mike McKenney, Warrant Officer, Solar Guard. See these hash marks? He suddenly held out a thick arm that bulged against a tight red sleeve. From the wrist to the elbow, the line of boys could see a solid corrugation of white, V-shaped stripes. Each one of these marks represents four years in space, he continued. There are ten marks here, and I intend on making it an even dozen. And no bunch of earthworms is going to make me lose a chance to get those last two by trying to make a space monkey out of me. McKenny sauntered along the line of boys with that same strange cat-like step and looked squarely into the eyes of each boy in turn. Just to set the record straight, I'm your cadet supervisor. I handle you until you either wash out and go home, or you finally blast off and become spacemen. If you stub your toe or cut your finger, come to me. If you get homesick, come to me. And if you get in trouble, he paused momentarily. Don't bother, because I'll be looking for you, with a fist full of demerits. McKenny continued slow inspection of the ranks, then suddenly stopped short. At the far end of the line, a tall, ruggedly built boy of about 18, with curly brown hair and a pleasant, open face, was stirring uncomfortably. He slowly reached down towards his bright boot and held it, while he wriggled his foot into it. McKenny quickly strode over and planted himself firmly in front of the boy. When I say, stand to, I mean, stand to, he roared. The boy jerked himself erect and snapped to attention. I, I'm sorry, sir, he stammered, but my boot, it, it was coming off and... I don't care if your pants are falling down, an order is an order. The boy gulped and reddened as a nervous titter rippled through the ranks. McKenny spun around and glared. There was immediate silence. What's your name? Corbett, sir. Cadet candidate, Tom Corbett, answered the boy. Want to be a spaceman, do ya? Asked Mike, pushing his jaw out another inch. Yes, sir. Been studying long, hard hours in primary school, eh? Talk your mother and father death in the years to let you come to Space Academy and be a spaceman. You want to feel those rockets bucking in your back out in the stars, eh? Yes, sir, replied Tom, wondering how this man he didn't even know could know so much about him. Well, you won't make it if I ever catch you disobeying orders again. McKenney turned quickly to see what effect he had created on the others. The lines of bewildered faces satisfied him that his old trick of using one of the cadets as an example was a success. He turned back to Corvette. 
The only reason I'm not logging you now is you're not a space cadet yet, and won't be until you've taken the Academy oath. Yes, sir. McKenny walked down the line and across the platform to an open teleceiver booth. The ranks were quiet and motionless, and as he made his call, McKenny smiled. Finally, when the tension seemed unbearable, he roared, At ease! and closed the door to the booth. The ranks melted immediately, and the boys fell into chattering clusters, their voices low, and they occasionally peered over their shoulders at Corbett, as if he had suddenly been stricken with a horrible plague. Brooding over the seeming ill fortune that called McKinney's attention to him at the wrong time, Tom sat down on his suitcase to adjust his boot. He shook his head slowly. He had heard Space Academy was tough, tougher than any other school in the world, but he didn't expect the stern discipline to begin so soon. This could be the beginning of the end, drawled a lazy voice in the back of Tom, for some of the more enthusiastic cadets. Someone laughed. Tom turned sea boy about his age, weight and height, with close-cropped blonde hair that stood up bush-like all over his head. He was lounging idly against a pillar, luggage piled high around his feet. Tom recognized him immediately as Roger Manning, and his pleasant features twisted into a scowl. Not what I'd expect from that character, he thought. After that trick he pulled on Astro, the big fellow from Venus? Tom saw it to run the night before, when the connecting links to transportation from all over the Solar Alliance had deposited the boys in the central station at Adam City, where they were to board the monorail express for the final lap of Space Academy. Manning, as Tom remembered it, had taken advantage of the huge Venusian by tricking him into carrying his luggage. Reasoning that since gravity on Venus was considerably less than on Earth, he convinced Astro that he needed the extra weight to maintain his balance. It had been a cheap trip, but no one had wanted to challenge the sharpness of Manning's tongue and come to Astro's rescue. Tom had wanted to, but refrained when he saw that Astro didn't mind. Finishing his conversation on the teleceiver, McKenny stepped out of the booth and faced the boys again. All right, he bawled. You're all set for you at the Academy. Pick up your gear and follow me. With a quick light step, he hopped on the rolling sidewalk at the edge of the platform and started moving away. Hey, Astro! Roger Manning stopped the huge boy about to step over. Going to carry my bags? The Venusian, a full head taller, hesitated and looked doubtfully at the four suitcases at Roger's feet. Come on! prodded Roger in a tone of mock good nature. The gravity around here is the same as in Adam City. It's the same all over the face of the Earth! Wouldn't want you just fly away! He snickered and looked around, winking broadly. Astro still hesitated. I don't know, Manning. I, uh... By the rings of Saturn, what's going on here? Suddenly, from outside the ring of boys that gathered around, McKenny came roaring in, pulling his way into the center of the group to face Roger and Astro. I have a strained wrist, sir, began Roger smoothly, and this cadet candidate, he nodded casually towards Astro, offered to carry my luggage. Now he refuses. Mike glared at Astro. Did you agree to carry this man's luggage? Well, I, uh, fumbled Astro. Well, did you or didn't you? I guess I sorta of did, sir, replied Astro, his face turning a slow red. I don't hold with anyone doing another man's work, but if a Solar Guard officer, a space cadet, or even a cadet candidate gives his word he'll do something, he does it. McKenny shook a finger in Astro's face, reaching up to do it. Is that clear? Yes, sir, was the embarrassed reply. McKenny turned to Manning, who stood listening, a faint smile playing on his lips. What's your name, mister? Manning. Roger Manning, he answered easily. So you've got a strained wrist, have you? Asked Mike mockingly, while sending a sweeping glance from top to bottom of the gaudy colored clothes. Yes, sir. Can't carry your own luggage, eh? Yes, answered Roger evenly. I could carry my own luggage. I thought the candidate from Venus might give me a helping hand. Nothing more. I certainly didn't intend for him to become a marked man for a simple gesture of comradeship. He glanced past McKenny towards the other boys and added softly, And comradeship is the spirit of Space Academy, isn't it, sir? His face suddenly crimsoned. McKenny spluttered, searching for a ready answer, then turned away abruptly. What are you all standing around for? He roared. Get your gear and get yourselves over on that sidewalk. Blast! He turned once again to the rolling platform. Manning smiled at Astro and hopped nimbly onto the sidewalk after McKenny, leaving his luggage in a heap in front of Astro. And be careful with that small case, Astro, he called as he drifted away. Here, Astro, I'll give you a hand, said Tom. Never mind, replied Astro grimly. I can handle him. No, let me help. Tom bent over, then suddenly straightened. By the way, we haven't introduced ourselves. My name's Corbett, Tom Corbett. He stuck out his hand. 
Astro hesitated, sizing up the curly-headed boy in front of him, who stood smiling and offering friendship. Finally, he pushed out his own hand and smiled back at Tom. Astro, but you know that by now. That sure was a dirty deal Manning gave you. Ah, uh, I don't mind carrying the bags. It's just that I wanted to tell him he's going to have to send it all back. They don't allow a candidate to keep more than a toothbrush at the academy. I uh, guess he'll find out the hard way. Carrying Manning's luggage as well as their own, they finally stepped on the slidewalk and began a smooth, easy ride from the monorail station to the academy. Both having felt the sharpness of Manning's tongue, and both having been dressed down by Warren Officer McKenney, they seemed to be linked by a bond of trouble, and they stood close together for mutual comfort. As the slide walked, Wisdom silently passed a few remaining buildings and credit exchanges that nestled around the monorail station, Tom gave a thought of his new life. Ever since John Bulicker, the space explorer, returning from the first successful flight to a distant galaxy, came through his hometown near New Chicago 12 years before, Tom had wanted to be a spaceman. Through high school, at the New Chicago Primary Space School, where he had taken his first flight above Earth's atmosphere, he had waited for the day when he would pass his entrance exams and be accepted as a cadet candidate in Space Academy. For no reason at all, a lump rose in his throat as the slide walk rounded the curve, and he saw for the first time the gleaming white magnificence of the Tower of Galileo. He recognized it immediately from the hundreds of books he had read about the Academy, and stared wordlessly. Sure is pretty, isn't it? asked Astro, his voice strangely husky. Yeah, breathed Tom in reply. It sure is. He could only stare at the shimmering tower ahead. It's all I've ever wanted to do, said Tom at length. Just get out there and be free. I know what you mean. It's the greatest feeling in the world. You say that as if you've already been up there. Astro grinned. Yep, used to be an enlisted space sailor. Bucked rockets and an old freighter on the Luna City Venusport run. <laughs> what are you doing here? Tom was amazed and impressed. Simple. I want to be an officer. I want to get into the Solar Guard and handle the power push in one of those cruisers. Tom's eyes glowed with a renewed admiration for his new friend. I've been out four or five times, but only in jet boats 500 miles out. Nothing like a jump to Luna City or Venusport. By now the sidewalk had carried them past the base of the Tower of Galileo, to a large building facing the Academy Quadrangle, and the spell was broken by McKenney's bull-throated roar. Haul off, you blasted pollywogs! As the boys jumped off the slidewalk, a cadet, dressed in the vivid blue that Tom recognized as the official dress of the Senior Cadet Corps, walked up to McKenney and spoke to him quietly. The warrant officer turned back to the waiting group and gave rapid orders. By twos, follow Cadet Herbert inside, and he'll assign you to your quarters. Shower, shave if you have to, and if you find anything to shave, and dress in the uniform that'll be supplied to you. Be ready to take the Academy Oath at... He paused and glanced at the Senior Cadet, who held up three fingers. Fifteen hundred hours. That's three o'clock. All clear? Blast off! Just as the boys began to move, there was a sudden blasting roar in the distance. The noise expanded and rolled across the hills surrounding Space Academy. It thundered over the grassy quadrangle, vibrating waves of sound one on top of the other, until the very air quivered under the impact. Mouths open, eyes popping, the cadet candidates stood rooted in their tracks and stared as, in the distance, a long, thin, needle-like ship seemed to balance delicately on a column of flame then suddenly shoot skyward and disappear. Pull in your eyeballs! McKinney's voice cracked over the receding thunder. You'll fly in one of those firecrackers someday, but right now you're earthworms! The lowest form of animal life in the academy! As the boys snapped to attention again, Tom thought he caught a faint smile on Cadet Herbert's face as he stood to one side, waiting for McKinney to finish his tirade. Suddenly he snapped his back straight, turned sharply, and stepped through the wide doors of the building. Quickly, the double line of boys followed. Did you see that, Astro? Asked Tom excitedly. That was a Solar Guard patrol ship. Yeah, I know, replied Astro. The big candidate from Venus scratched his chin and eyed Tom bashfully. Say, Tom, uh, since we sort of know each other, how about us trying to get in the same quarters? Okay by me, Astro, if we can, said Tom, grinning back at his friend. The line pressed forward to Cadet Herbert, who was now waiting at the bottom of the slide stairs. A mesh belt spiraled upwards in the narrow well to the upper stories of the building. Speaking into an audio scriber, a machine that transmitted spoken words into TypeScript, he repeated the names of the candidates as they passed. Cadet Candidate Tom Corbett, announced Tom, and Herbert repeated it into the audio scriber. Cadet Candidate Astro, the big Venusian stepped forward. What's the rest of it, mister? inquired Herbert. That's all. Just Astro. No other names? No, sir, replied Astro. You see? You don't say sir to a senior cadet, mister, and we're not interested in why you have only one name, Herbert snapped. Yes, sir. Uh, mister. 
Astro flushed and joined Tom. Cadet candidate Philip Morgan, announced the next boy. Herbert repeated the name into the machine, then announced, Cadet candidates Tom Corbett, Astro, and Philip Morgan assigned to Section 42D. Turning to the three boys, he indicated the spiraling slide stairs. 42nd floor, you'll find Section D in the starboard wing. Astro and Tom immediately began to pile Manning's luggage to one side of the slide stairs. Take your luggage with you, misters, snapped Herbert. It isn't ours, replied Tom. Isn't yours? Herbert glanced over the pile of suitcases and turned back to Tom. Whose is it, then? Belongs to cadet candidate Roger Manning, replied Tom. What are you doing with it? We were carrying it for him. Do we have a candidate in the group who finds it necessary to provide himself with valet service? Herbert moved along the line of boys. Will cadet candidate Roger Manning please step forward? Roger slid from behind a group of boys to face the senior cadet's cold stare. Roger Manning here. He presented himself smoothly. Is that your luggage? Herbert jerked his thumb over his shoulder. It is. Roger smiled confidently, but Herbert merely stared coldly. You have a peculiar attitude for a candidate, Manning. Is there a prescribed attitude, Mr. Herbert? Roger asked, his smile broadening. If there is, I'll only be too glad to conform to it. Herbert's face twitched almost imperceptibly. Then he nodded, made a notation on the pad, and returned to his post at the head of the gaping line of boys. From now on, Cadet Manning, you will be responsible for your own belongings. Tom, Astro, and Philip Morgan stepped onto the slide stairs and began their spiraling ascent to the 42nd floor. Ah, saw what happened at the monorail station, crawled the third member of Section 42D, leaning against the banister of the moving belt. By the craters of Luna, that Manning fella sure is a hot operator. We found out for ourselves, grunted Astro. Say, since we're all bunking together, let's get to knowing each other. My name's Phil Morgan. Come from Georgia. Where are you all from? New Chicago, replied Tom. Name's Tom Corbett, and this is Astro. Hiya. Astro stuck out his big paw and grinned his wide grin. I guess you heard. Astro's all the name I've got. How come? inquired the southerner. I'm from Venus, and it's custom from way back when Venus was first colonized just to hand out one name. Funny custom, drawled Phil. Astro started to say something, then stopped, clamping his lips together. Tom could see his face turn a slow pink. Phil saw it too and hastily added, Oh, I didn't mean anything. I... He broke off, embarrassed. Forget it, Phil. Astro grinned again. Say, interjected Tom, look at that. They all turned to look at the floor they were passing. Near the edge of the step-off platform on the fourth floor was an oaken panel inscribed with silver lettering in relief. As they drew even with the plaque, they caught sight of someone behind them. They turned to see Manning, a pile of suitcases in front of him, reading aloud, To the brave men who sacrificed their lives in the conquest of space, this galaxy hall was dedicated. Say, this must be the museum, said Tom. Here's where they have all the original gear used in the first space hops. Absolutely right, said Manning with a smile. I wonder if we could get off and take a look, Astro asked. Sure he can, said Roger. In fact, the Academy regs say that every cadet must inspect the exhibits in the space museum within the first week. The members of Section 42D looked at Roger questioningly. I don't know if we have time. Tom was dubious. Sure, you have plenty. I'd hop off and take a look at myself, but I've got to get all this junk ready to ship home. He indicated the pile of bags in front of him. Oh, come on, Tom. Let's take a look, urged Astro. They have the old Space Queen in here. First ship to clear Earth's gravity. Boy, I'd sure like to see her. Without waiting for the others to agree, the huge candidate stepped off the slide stairs. Hey, Astro! yelled Tom. Wait, I don't think... His voice trailed off as the moving stairs carried him up to the next floor. But then a curious thing happened. As the other boys came abreast of the museum floor and saw Astro, they began to get off and follow him, wandering around, gazing at the relics of the past. Soon nearly half of the cadet candidates were standing in silent awe in front of the battered hull of the Space Queen, the first atomic-powered rocket ship, allowed on exhibition only 50 years before because of the deadly radioactivity in her hull, created when a lead baffle melted in mid-space and flooded the ship with murderous gamma rays. They stood in front of the spaceship and listened while Astro, in a hushed voice, read the inscription on the bronze tablet, Birth to Luna and Return, 7th March, 2051, in honor of the brave men on the first atomic-powered spaceship to land successfully on the planet Moon, only to perish on return to Earth. Candidates, stand to! Like a clap of thunder, warned Officer McKinney's voice jarred the boys out of their silence. He stepped forward like a bantam rooster and faced a startled group of boys. I want to know just one thing. Who stepped off that slide stairs first? The boys all hesitated. I, I guess I was first, sir, said Astro, stepping forward. 
Oh, you guessed you were the first, eh? Roared McKenny. Taking a deep breath, McKenny launched into a blistering tirade. His choice of words were to be long remembered by the group and repeated to succeeding classes. Storming against the huge Venusian like a pygmy attacking an elephant, McKenny roared, berated, and blasted. Later, when Astro finally reached his quarters and changed into the green coveralls of the cadet candidates, Tom and Phil crowded around him. It was Roger, blast him, said Tom angrily. He was getting back at you because Cadet Herbert made him carry his own gear. I asked for it, grumbled Astro. Oh, I should have known better, but I just couldn't wait to see the Queen. He balled his huge hands into tight knots and stared at the floor. Now hear this. A voice suddenly rasped over the PA system loudspeaker above the door. All cadet candidates will come to immediate attention and receive the Space Academy oath from Commander Walter. The voice paused. Attention! Cadet candidates, stand to! This is Commander Walter speaking. A deep, powerful voice purred through the speakers. The Academy oath is taken individually. It is something each candidate locks into his spirit, his mind, and his heart. That is why it is taken in your quarters. The oath is not to show colors. It is a way of life. Each candidate will face as closely as possible in the direction of his home and swear by his individual god as he repeats after me. Astro stepped quickly to the window port and gazed into the blue heavens, eyes searching for the misty planet Venus. Phil Morgan thought a moment and faced towards the wall with the inlaid star chart of the sky, thinking of sunbathed Georgia. Tom Corbett stared straight at the blank wall. Each boy did not see what was in front of him. Yet he saw further, perhaps, than he had ever seen before. He looked into a future which held the limitlessness of the universe and new worlds and planets to be lifted out of the oblivion of uncharted depths of space to come. They repeated slowly. I, I solemnly, solemnly swear to the whole constitution of the Solar Alliance to obey interplanetary law, to protect the liberties of the planets, safeguard the freedom of space, and to uphold cause of peace throughout the universe. universe. To this end, I dedicate my life. End of Chapter 1 Chapter 2 of Stand By for Mars This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Sean O'Hara Stand By for Mars by Kerry Rockwell Chapter 2 Tom Corbett's first day at Space Academy began at 0530 hours with the blaring of the Cadet Corps song over the central communicators. From the rocket fields of the Academy to the far-flung stars of outer space, we're space cadets training to be ready for the dangers we may face. Up in the sky, rocketing past, higher than high, faster than fast, out into space, into the sun, look at her go when we give her the gun. From the rocket fields of the Academy. Within 60 seconds, the buildings of the Academy rocked with the impact of 3,000 voices singing the last stanza. Lights flashed on in every window. Cadets raced through the halls and across the quadrangle. The central communicator began the incessant muttering of cadets and the never-ending orders of the day. Unit 38Z, report to Captain Edwards for astrogation. Unit 68E, report for Commander Walters for special assignments. On and on, down the list of senior cadets, watch officers, and newly arrived earthworms, units and individuals to report for training or study of everything from ground assembly of an atomic rocket motor to the history of the founding of the Solar Alliance, the governing body of the Triplanet Civilization. Tom Corbett stepped out of the shower in Section 42D and bellowed at the top of his voice, Hit the deck, Astro! Make use of the gravity! He tugged at an outsized foot dangling over the side of the upper bunk. Uh, groaned the cadet from Venus and tried to go back to sleep. Philip Morgan stepped into the shower, turned on the cold water, screeched at the top of his voice, gradually trailing off in countless repetitions of the last verse of the Academy song. Damp your tubes, you blasted space monkey, roared Astro, sitting up bleary-eyed. What time do we eat? asked Tom, pulling on the green one-piece coverall of the Earthworm Cadet candidates. I don't know, replied Astro, opening his mouth in a cavernous yawn. But it better be soon. I like space, but not between my backbone and my stomach. Warrant Officer McKinney burst into the room and began to compete with the rest of the noise outside the buildings. Five minutes to the dining hall, and you'd better not be late. Take the slide stairs down to the 28th floor, tell the mess cadet in charge of the hall your unit number, and he'll show you to the right table. Remember where it is, because you'll have to find it for yourself after that, or not eat. Finish your breakfast and report to the 99th floor to Dr. Dale at 700 hours. And as fast as he had arrived, he was gone, a flash of red color with the rasping voice trailing behind. 
Exactly one hour and ten minutes later, promptly at seven o'clock, the three members of Unit 42D stood at attention in front of Dr. Joan Dale, along with the rest of the green-clad cadets. When the cat calls and wolf whistles had died away, Dr. Dale, pretty, trim, and dressed in gold and black uniform of the Solar Guard, held up her hand and motioned for the cadets to sit down. My answer to your... She paused, smiled, and continued. Your enthusiastic welcome is simply thank you. But we'll have no further repetitions. This is Space Academy, not a primary school. Turning abruptly, she stood beside a round desk in the well of an amphitheater and held up a thin tube about an inch in diameter and 12 inches long. We will now begin your classification tests, she said. You will receive one of these tubes. Inside, you will find four sheets of paper. You are to answer all the questions on each page and place them back in the tube. Take the tube and drop it in the green outline slot in this wall. She indicated a four-inch round hole to her left, outlined with green paint. Beside it was another slot, outlined with red paint. Remain there until the tube is returned to you in this red slot. Take it back to your desk. She paused and glanced down at her desk. Now, there are four possible classifications for a cadet. Control deck officer, which includes leadership and command. Astrogation officer, which includes radar and communication. And power deck officer, for engine room operations. The fourth classification is for advanced scientific study here at the Academy. Your papers are studied by an electronic calculator that is proven infallible. You must make at least a passing grade on each of the four classifications. Dr. Dale looked up at the rows of upturned, non-smiling faces and stepped from the dais, coming to a halt near the first desk. I know that all of you have your hearts set on becoming spacemen, officers in the Solar Guard. Most of you want to be space pilots. But there must be astrogators, radar engineers, communication officers, and power deck operators on each ship, and... She paused, braced her shoulder, and added, Some of you will not be accepted for any of these. Some of you will wash out. Dr. Dale turned her back on the cadets, not wanting to look at the sudden pallor that washed over their faces. It was brutal, she thought, this test. Why bring them all the way to the academy and then give them the test? Why not start the entrance exams at the beginning with a classification and aptitude? But she knew the answer even before the thoughtful question was completed. Under the fear of being washed out, the weaker ones would not pass. The Solar Guard could not afford to have cadets and later Solar Guard officers who could not function under pressure. She began handing out the tubes and, one by one, the green-clad candidates stepped to the front of the room to receive them. E excuse me, ma'am, said one cadet falteringly. I if I wash out as a cadet, as a Solar Guard officer cadet, he gulped several times. Does that mean there isn't any chance of becoming a spaceman? No, she answered kindly. You can become a member of the enlisted Solar Guard if you pass the acceleration tests. Thank you, ma'am, replied the boy and turned away nervously. Tom Corbett accepted the tube and hurried back to his seat. He knew that this was the last hurdle. He did not know that the papers had been prepared individually, the tests given on the basis of the entrance exams he had taken at the New Chicago Primary Space School. He opened the tube, pulling out the four sheets, printed on both sides of the paper, and read the heading on the first. Astrogation, communication to signals, radar. He studied the first question. What is the range of the Mark 9 radar scope, and how far can a spaceship be successfully distinguished from other objects in space? He read the question four times, then pulled out a pencil and began to write. Only the rustle of papers, or the occasional sigh of dead over a problem, disturbed the silence of the high ceiling room as a hundred odd cadets fought questions. There was a sudden stir in the room, and Tom looked up to see Roger Manning walk to the slot and casually deposit his tube in the green building slot. Then he leaned idly against the wall, waiting for it to be returned. As he stood there, he spoke to Dr. Dale. He smiled and replied. There was something about his attitude that made Tom boil. So fast? He glanced at his own papers. He had hardly finished two sheets and thought he was doing fine. He clenched his teeth and bent over the paper again, redoubling his efforts to triangulate a fix on regulars by using dead reckoning as basis for his computations. Suddenly, a tall man wearing the uniform of a Solar Guard officer appeared in the back of the room. As Dr. Dale looked up and smiled a greeting, he placed his fingers on his lips. Steve Strong, captain in the Solar Guard, gazed around the room at the packs bent over busy pencils. He did not smile, remembering how, only 15 years before, he had gone through the same torture, racking his brains trying to adjust the measurements of magnitude. He was joined by a thin, handsome young man, Lieutenant Judson Siminski, and finally, warned officer McKenney. They nodded silently in greeting. It would be over soon. Strong glanced at the clock over the desk. Another ten minutes to go. The line of boys at the slots grew until more than twenty stood there, each waiting patiently, nervously, for his turn to drop the tube in the slot and receive in return the sealed cylinder that held his fate. Still at his desk, his face wet with sweat, Astro looked at the question in front of him for the fifteenth time. Estimate the time it would take a 300-ton rocket ship with half-filled tanks, cruising at the most economical speed to make a trip from Titan to Venusport. 
A. Estimate the size and maximum capacity of the fuel tanks. B. Give estimate of speed ship would utilize. He thought. He slumped in his chair. He stared at the ceiling. He chewed his pencil. Five seats away, Tom stacked his examination sheets neatly, twisted them into a cylinder, and inserted them into the tube. As he passed the line of desks and headed for the slot, a hand caught his arm. Tom turned to see Roger Manning grinning at him. Worried, space boy? asked Roger easily. Tom didn't answer. He simply withdrew his arm. You know, said Roger, you're really a nice kid. It's a shame you won't make it. But the rules specifically say... No cabbage heads. No talking, Dr. Dale called sharply from her desk. Tom walked away and stood in the line at the slots. He found himself wanting to pass more than anything in the world. Please, he breathed. Please, just let me pass. A soft gong began to sound. Dr. Dale stood up. Time's up, she announced. Please put your papers in the tubes and drop them in the slot. Tom turned to the Astro, stuffing his papers in the thin cylinder disgustedly. Phil Morgan came up and stood in back of Tom. His face was flushed. Everything okay, Phil? inquired Tom. Easy as free fall in space, replied the other cadet, his soft Georgian drawl full of confidence. How about you? I'm just hoping against hope. A few remaining stragglers hurried up to the line. Think Astro will make it? asked Phil. I don't know, answered Tom. I saw him sweating over there like a man facing death. I guess he is, in a way. Astro took his place in line and shrugged his shoulders when Tom leaned forward to give him a questioning look. Get ahead, Tom, urged Phil. Tom turned and dropped his tube into the green bordered slot and waited. He stared straight at the wall in front of him, hardly daring to breathe. Presently, the tube was returned in the red slot. He took it, turned it over in his hands, and walked slowly back to his desk. You're washed out, cabbage head. Manning's whisper followed him. Let's see if you can take it without bawling. Tom's face burned and he fought an impulse to answer Manning with a stiff belt in the jaw, but he kept walking, reached his desk, and sat down. Astro, the last to return to his desk, held the tube out in front of him as though it were alive. The room was silent as Dr. Dale rose from her desk. All right now, boys, she announced. Inside the tubes, you will find colored slips of paper. Those of you who have red slips will remain here. Those who find green slips will return to their quarters. Blue will go with Captain Strong, orange with Lieutenant Siminski, and purple with Warrant Officer McKenney. Now please open the tubes. There was a tinkling of metal caps and then a slight rustle of papers as each boy withdrew the contents of the tube before him. Tom took a deep breath and felt inside with the paper. He held his breath and pulled it out. It was green. He didn't know what that meant. He looked around. Phil was signaling to him, holding up a blue slip. Tom's heart skipped a beat. Whatever the colors meant, he and Phil were apart. He turned quickly around and caught Astro's eye. The big Venusian held up a green slip. Tom's heart nearly stopped beating. Phil, who had breathed through with such confidence, held a blue slip. And Astro, who hadn't even finished the test, held up the same color he had. It could only mean one thing. Failure. He felt the tears welling up in his eyes, but had no strength left to fight them back. He looked up, his eyes meeting the insolent stare of Roger Manning, who was half turned in the seat. Remembering the caustic warning of the confident cadet, Tom fought back the flood of tears in his eyes and glared back. What would he tell his mother, and his father, and Billy, his brother, five years younger than himself, whom he had promised to bring a flask of water from the Grand Canal on Mars, and his sister? Tom remembered the shining pride in her eyes when she kissed him goodbye at the Stratoport as he left for Adam City. From the front of the room, McKenny's rasping voice charged him back to the present. Cadets, stand to! There was a shuffle of feet as the voice rose as one. All the purple slips, follow me! He roared and turned toward the door. The cadets with purple slips marched after him. Lieutenant Siminski stepped briskly to the front of the room. Cadets with orange slips will please come with me, he said casually, and another group of cadets left the room. From the rear of the room, Captain Strong snapped out an order. Blue slips will come with me. He turned smartly and followed the last of Lieutenant Siminski's cadets out of the room. Tom looked around. The room was nearly empty now. He looked over at Astro and saw his big friend slump moodily against his desk. Then, suddenly, he noticed Roger Manning. The arrogant cadet was not smiling any longer. He was staring straight ahead. Before him on the desk, Tom could see a green slip. So he had failed too, thought Tom grimly. It was poor solace for the misery he felt. Dr. Dale stepped forward again. Will the cadets holding the green slips return to their quarters? Those with red slips will remain in their seats, she announced. Tom found himself moving with difficulty. As he walked through the door, Astro joined him. They looked more eloquent than words passed between them, and they made their way silently up the slide stairs back to their quarters. Lying in his bunk, hands under his head, eyes staring into space, Tom asked, What happens now? Sprawled on his bunk, Astro didn't answer right away. He merely gulped and swallowed hard. Uh, I don't know. He finally stammered. I just don't know. 
what will you do? Back to the hold of Venus Sport Trader, I guess. I don't know. Astro paused and looked at Tom. What will you do? Go home, Tom said simply. Go home and find a job. Ever think about the enlisted solar guard? Look at McKenny. Yeah, but... I know how you feel, sighed Astro. Being in the enlisted section is, well, like being a passenger almost. The door was suddenly flung open. All off them bunks, you blasted earthworms! McKenny stood in the doorway in his usual aggressive pose, and Tom and Astro hit the floor together to stand at attention. Where's the other cadet? He went with Captain Strong, sir, answered Tom. Oh, said Mike, and in a surprisingly soft tone he added, You two pulled the green slips, eh? Yes, yes sir, they replied together. Well, I don't know how you did it, but congratulations! You passed a classification test, both of you. Tom just looked at the scarlet-clad, stumpy warrant officer. He couldn't believe his ears. Suddenly he felt as if he had been lifted off his feet, and then he realized that he was off his feet. Astro was holding him over his head. Then he dumped him on his bunk as easily as if he had been a child. And at the same time, the big Venusian let out a long, long, ear-splitting yell. McKenny matched him with his own bull-like roar. Plug that foghorn, you blasted earthworm! You'll have the whole academy in here thinking there's a murder! By this time, Tom was on his feet again, standing in front of McKenny. You mean we made it? We're really in? We're cadets? That's right! McKenny looked at the clipboard in his hand and read, Cadet Corvette, Tom, qualified for control deck. Cadet Astro, power deck. Astro took a deep breath and started another yell, but before he could let go, McKenny clamped a big hand over his mouth. You bellow like that again and I'll make meteor dust out of you. Astro gulped and then matched Tom's grin with one that spread from ear to ear. What happened to Philip Morgan? asked Tom. What color slip did he have? Blue. Anything besides green washed out, replied Mike quickly. Now let's see, you have a replacement for Morgan in this unit, an astrogator. Greetings, gentlemen, drawled a voice that Tom recognized without even looking. Allow me to introduce myself to my new unit mates. My name's Manning, Roger Manning, but then we're old friends, aren't we? Stow that rocket wash, Manning, snapped Mike. He glanced at the clock over the door. You have an hour and 45 minutes until lunchtime. I suggest you take a walk around the academy and familiarize yourself with the arrangement of the buildings. And then, for the first time, Tom saw the hard little spaceman smile. I'm glad you made it, boys, all three of you. He paused and looked at each of them in turn. And I can honestly say I am looking forward to the day when I can serve under you. He snapped his back straight, gave the three startled boys a crisp salute, executed a perfect about face, and marched out of the room. And that, drawled Roger, strolling over the bunk nearest the window, is the corniest bit of space gas I've ever heard. Listen, Manning, drawled Astro, spinning around quickly to face him. Yeah, purred Roger, his eyes drawn to fine points, hands hanging loosely at his sides. What would you like me to listen to, Cadet Astro? The hulking cadet lunged at Manning, but Tom quickly stepped between them. Hey, stow it, both of you, he shouted. We're in this room together, so we might as well make the best of it. Of course, Corbett, of course, replied Manning easily. He turned his back on Astro, who stood, feet wide apart, neck muscles tight, and hands clenched in hand-like fists. One of these days, Manning, I'll break you in two. I'll close that fast-talking mouth of yours for good. Astro's voice was a low growl. Roger stood near the window port and appeared to have forgotten the incident. The light shining in from the hallway darkened, and Tom turned to see three blue-clad senior cadets arranged in a row just inside the door. Congratulations, gentlemen, you are now qualified cadets of Space Academy, said a red-headed lad about 21. My name is Al Dixon. He turned to his left and right. And these are cadets Bill Houseman and Rodney Rithrop. Hiya, replied Tom. Glad to know you. I'm Tom Corbett. This is Astro and Roger Manning. Astro shook hands, the three senior cadets giving a long glance at the side of the hand he offered. Roger came forward smartly and shook hands with a smile. We're sort of like a committee, began Dixon. We've come to sign you up for the Academy Sports Program. They made themselves comfortable in the room. You have a chance to take part in three sports. Free fall wrestling, mercury ball, and space chess. Dixon glanced at Houseman and Withrop. From the looks of Cadet Astro, free fall wrestling should be a child's play for him. Astro merely grinned. Mercury ball is pretty much like the old game of soccer, explained Houseman, but inside the ball is a smaller ball filled with mercury, making it take crazy dips and turns. You have to be pretty fast even to touch it. Sounds like you have to be a little mercurian yourself, smiled Tom. You do, replied Dixon. Oh yes, you three play as a unit. Competition starts in a few days, so if you've never played before, you might want to go down to the gym and start practicing. 
You mentioned space chess, asked Roger. What's that? It's really nothing more than maneuvers. Space maneuvers, said Dixon. A glass case, seven foot cube, is divided by light shaft into smaller cubes of equal size and shape. Each man has a complete space squadron. Three model rocket cruisers, six destroyers, ten scouts. The ships are filled with gas to make them float, and their power is derived from magnetic force. The problem is to get a combination of cruisers and destroyers and scouts into a space section where it could knock out your opponent's ship. You mean, interrupted Astro, you've got to keep track of all those ships at once? Ah, don't worry, Astro, commented Roger quickly. You use your muscles to win for dear old 42D in free fall wrestling. Corbett here can pound down the grassy field for a goal in Mercury Ball, and I'll do the brain work of space chess. The three visiting cadets exchanged sharp glances. Everybody plays together, Manning, said Dixon. You three take part in each sport as a unit. Of course, nodded Roger. Of course, a unit. The three cadets stood up, shook hands all around, and left. Tom immediately turned to Manning. What was the idea of that crack about brains? Manning slouched over to the window port and said over his shoulder, I don't know how your king-sized friend here passed the classification test for it, and I don't care. But as you say, we're a unit, so we might as well make adjustments. He turned to face them with cold stare. I know the academy like palm my hand. Never mind how, just take it for granted. I know it. I'm here for the ride. For a special reason, I wouldn't care to have you know. I'll get my training and then pull out. He took a step forward, his face masked bitterness. So from now on, you two guys leave me alone. You bore me to death with your emotional childish allegiance to this, this. He paused and spit the last out cynically. Space Kindergarten. End of chapter two.